I want you to open up your Bibles with me, please, to the third chapter of the book of Acts. We'll be looking at the healing of the lame man, but we are not going to spend a long time in this story because we're going to use it as a diving board into God's bucket list. And I want to talk about God's bucket list, things that God hasn't done yet that God is going to do. And I'm grateful for the fact that we have a God that has plans and plans for you and I. Amen. He has plans for the graveyard. God has plans for the sick and the weary. He's a God of great plans and blessings. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word, Acts chapter 3. We're going to read down to verse 8. It says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask of alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him, Peter did, by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he went leaping up and stood and walked And entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. I want to use for a subject tonight, God's bucket list. You may be seated. This lame man, according to the scriptures, he had been there over 40 years, his age, over 40 years. And he had been laid at that gate daily, the scripture says, at the gate called Beautiful for years and years and years. And the truth is, Jesus Christ passed by him over and over as he went to the temple. Yet Jesus did not heal this lame man because Jesus had bigger plans for this lame man. In fact, I believe Jesus, every time he passed by this lame man, I believe he said to his heart, he's on my bucket list. I'm going to reach out and touch him, but I'm not going to do it through me. I'm going to do it through Peter and John. Because I'm going to take this lame man at the gate called Beautiful for over 40 years his age was, and I'm going to use him to ignite a Holy Ghost revival at the time of Pentecost. I believe Jesus, every time he saw that lame man, he said in his heart, your day's coming. You're on my bucket list. I've got plans for you. And plans he did because on the day of Pentecost, there was 3,000 souls saved on the day of Pentecost. How many would agree that 3,000 souls is a pretty good harvest? And we're talking about the church getting its start. We're talking about it bursting, 3,000. That's a good start. But Jesus is going to use the fuel of this lame man. He's going to use the miracle of this lame man to fuel another 5,000 souls to be saved. 8,000 people saved in just a matter of days. As the lame man's there on the Lord's bucket list, Peter walks, and Peter and John, as they walk by, that lame man saw them, and Peter stopped. I think John thought, now what are we doing? And Peter stopped and said, look on us. And John probably thought, you're dragging me into this? And Peter said, look on us. And the Bible says the lame man looked upon them expecting to receive something. This lame man was begging of alms. 
As I've said in a sorry, sick pun, he begged for arms and he got legs. I know it's disgusting. I know it's, but anyway, it's fun. How about some Wednesday night fun? And the lame man is told to look on Peter and John. And as he looked on Peter and John, he was expecting something exciting to happen. And Peter said to the lame man, silver and gold, have I none? But such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And Peter reached out and took him by the hand, and immediately he lifted him up and snapped, crackle, pop, his bones began strength, and leaped and stood. And he said, I'm not just going to stand. He went walking and leaping and praising God. Woo! He went walking and leaping and praising God. By the way, the church needs to learn walking and leaping and praising God. The church was ignited with walking and leaping and praising God. I mean, Jesus didn't pick someone to be healed at the, at the start of Pentecost that would say, oh boy, I thank God I got my legs back. No, Jesus picked someone that went crazy, that went walking and leaping and praising God. He picked a vocal person. He picked a person that would be leaping and jumping and shouting, giving God glory. He picked a person that would go into the temple and break up the Pharisees' routine. And blow the starch off of them scribes. And he went walking and leaping and praising God. And I believe Peter went walking and leaping and praising God. I believe John went walking and leaping and praising God. I believe they, I believe there was, they had a Jericho march going around. Walking and leaping and praising God. Walking and leaping and praising God. I believe it was an exciting time. And so Jesus chose not to heal this man within the three and a half years of his ministry. Knowing that he was going to hand that mantle down to Peter and John. He knew that Peter would preach on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 souls would be saved, and then he knew that just a few days later he would refuel that by healing a lame man through the name of Jesus Christ, Peter and John, and that lame man would keep it going. Keep it moving. Amen. Church folks need to learn how to keep it going. You come to church, we'll keep it going. You sing and worship God, then keep it going. You're excited about the Lord, keep it going. You fill the house of the Lord with excitement, keep it going. God wants us to keep it going. Now, we're going to go away from the story because I want to talk to you about God's bucket list. First of all, I want to say that Jesus has a giving heart to love us. God is a giver. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So God is a giver. He wants to give. He wants to bless. He wants to touch our lives. God is a giver. And just like Sunday, I preached on the thief on the cross that said, you know, he put the dots together. He decided Jesus is the Lord, Luke chapter 23 uh, verse 42 and 43, and the thief said, uh, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus Christ said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Woo, praise the Lord. And I talked about, Lord, remember me, remember me, remember me, remember me. And I'm glad that we can shout, Lord, remember me. I'm glad that we can give God glory and begin to give God praise and begin to Worship the Lord and honor God by giving God praise and worshiping the Lord. God is a giving God. Jesus came to give us. He came to love us. He's a, he has a giving heart. Jesus has a giving heart. Are you listening to me? And Jesus came to prove the big heart of God who loves, who, who wants to forgive. And he wants to remember us. And thank God 
We can shout, Lord, remember me in our lowest moments. We can shout, Lord, remember me in our days of affliction. We can shout, Lord, remember me when it looks like we're going nowhere. We can shout, Lord, remember me when all the problems and trials of life comes our way. We can shout, Lord, remember me. And the Lord remembers us and he moves upon us because we've got a powerful God. And I want to mention this. Jesus has powerful hands to keep us. You know, we need someone that's got stronger hands than ourselves. And Jesus has strong hands, powerful hands to keep us. I believe that. Isaiah 51 verse, or 59 rather, verse 1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is, it, is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. Notice it says that Jesus does not have a short hand. He does not have a weak hand. He, he has a hand that can reach you, move upon you, rescue you, keep you. The mighty hands of Jesus Christ. We are told in Isaiah verse five, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 25, that God is going to judge Israel, and he brought forth judgment upon Israel. Five times during the judgment and during the rejection of God, idolatry, wartime, devastation upon Israel, God stated, Five times, but his hand is stretched out still. When everything was going wrong, five times, Isaiah says his hand was stretched out still. But his hand was stretched out still. Now, there are those people that believe, and that's, of course, found in Isaiah 5, 25, Isaiah 9, verse 12, verse 17, and verse 21, and Isaiah 10, verse 4. And there are those that believe that when God was judging Israel for their sin, but his hand was stretched out still, they, they look at that in a negative way, saying, well, you know, God didn't spare. He just kept judging, keep pouring out his judgment, but his hand was, was uh, stretched out still. Or you can interpret that the other way. In the middle of all the judgment that God was pouring out upon Israel, God still had his hand stretched out still to offer them an opportunity to repent and come back to him through the glory of God. Now, whichever, whichever interpretation you have with that, Jesus Christ pretty much removed the confusion. In the Old Testament, we find, but his hand, his arm, his hand was stretched out still. That's in the Old Testament. His hand was stretched out still. And whether you look at that in a negative sense or whether you look at it in a positive sense, Jesus comes along and clears up the confusion. He removes the confusion. Because Jesus comes, and he comes and touches the leper. Jesus comes, and his hand is stretched out still. Jesus come and he touched the leper. He touched the ears of the deaf. He touched the tongue of the mute. He touched the blind. Jesus came and touched the lame. So Jesus come to show us maybe in the Old Testament God's hand was stretched out still and you interpret that negative. I want to clear up all confusion. God's a good God. I want to clear up all confusion. Jesus Christ has come to show us the true and living God. I want to clear up the confusion. Yes, God's hand is stretched out not to destroy us but to save us. And Jesus shows up and says welcome to you just watch God's hand. Jesus Christ is the hand of God. And so Jesus Christ comes and he brings the hand of God to the lame, to the dying, to the hurting. And not only did he bring the, the hand of God to the lame, the hurting, the blind, the dying, to clear up any confusion that God's hand, but you're going through a hard time, but you're going through a storm, but you're going through a war, but you're going through a time of persecution, but you're going through a time that you feel like God is down on you and persecuting you and, and bringing judgment again, but the hand of the Lord is still, is stretched out still. And Jesus Christ come to show us that the hand of the Lord is a hand that causes the blind to see. The hand of the Lord is the hand that causes the leper to be cleansed. The hand of the Lord is the hand that causes the, 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 the mute 
tongue to speak again. The hand of the Lord uh, is there to touch the blind, to touch the lame. And Jesus Christ came to touch us. Did you know we got a God, not only that we can touch, we got a God that can touch us. Now, I, in my life, have touched God. I have touched God. And it was so blessed. It was so wonderful when I could reach out and touch God. I, it was just wonderful. But it does not compare to how it feels when God touches me. When God touches you, it is altogether lovely. When God touches you, it is amazing. I love touching God, but there's always that doubt when you're trying to touch God. But when God touches you, all doubt's gone. My heart melts like butter. And Jesus Christ came to show us the hand of God, but his hand stretched out still. That's what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. His hands were stretched out still. His hands were stretched out on the cross of Calvary, stretched out still until he died in the stillness of death. After offering the sacrifice for our sins, he stretched out his hands. And I want you to know God's hands are still stretched out still. I want to share something with you tonight that is just, it's just incredible. Jesus has looking eyes to watch over us. Jesus is watching us. In fact, Jesus is watching our every move. Hello? You say, Jesus doesn't know where I'm at. He knows where you're at. He knows how you're feeling. He knows where you're sitting. He knows who you are. He knows what you're thinking. Jesus Christ knows where you're at. But I'm in a storm. He knows that. But I'm in a time of depression. He knows that. But I'm in a time of sickness and hurt and pain. He knows that. But I want you to see something that is incredible. Second Chronicles 16, verse 9. Talking about the eyes of the Lord. For the eyes of the Lord run. Everybody shout, run. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Well, last I checked, I'm still on planet earth. I wonder about some politicians, but last I checked, I'm still on planet earth. I wonder that sometimes about some people in church, but last I checked, I'm on planet earth. And by the way, planet earth is what gives me all the trouble. Planet Earth is what has all the graveyards. Planet Earth has all, has all the hard times. Planet Earth has all the sickness and diseases. Glad God's going to scrap it and make a new earth. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. But until then, the eyes of the Lord runs to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong. God's going to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect Toward him. You know, wait, a minute, wait a minute, preacher. I'm not perfect. That's not what this verse is saying. Well, you know, I got to be perfect. Listen to me. That's not what this verse is saying. Let me correct it so you can see what he's basically saying. Perfect means focused on him. A perfect heart means not to be double minded. Perfect heart is to be focused. That's what Peter mentioned as a pure mind. And a perfect Heart means one that is perfect toward him. Focused. Isn't that good? And God runs to and fro. His eyes dart back and forth to find that one person that is focused on him. God's eyes run to and fro, dart back and forth to find one person that is focused. You want to bring me a different mic? Which one we want? The yellow one? I knew my I knew my knees were bad, but didn't know they were popping that bad. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we'll just scrap everything and buy all brand new, huh? We'll fix it up. We'll get it fixed. But notice it says that the Lord's eyes dart to and fro. God is looking, and he's looking fast. 
God's looking fast. He's darting back. His eyes are darting back and forth because he wants to focus on you. If you focused on him, God definitely wants to focus on you. And I'm glad that God focused on me in 1978, January the 15th. God focused on me and I was born again, Amen. saved by the power of God. And the eyes of the Lord are looking. Number four, Jesus has open ears to hear us. Open ears to hear us. Have you ever got around someone and they didn't have ears open to hear you? They just didn't have ears to hear you. If you don't mind, pull these monitors down. They're, they're echoing quite a bit. Ringing in my ears. And if it's going to ring in anybody's ears, let it be you, not me. But... Jesus' ears are open unto us to hear us. I love this Psalm 34, verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. That would mean the eyes of the Lord are upon the saved. The eyes of the Lord are upon the saved. And his ears are open unto their cry. Anybody cried lately? Cried. There's different forms of crying. There, there's crying that involves tears. There's crying that involves grief. There's crying that involves broken heart. Or crying that involves disappointment. There's crying that involves tears and sobbing. There's crying that involves silence. Just in your heart, you're silently crying. There's different forms of crying. Some loud, some quiet, but nonetheless, there's the, the there's that sobbing, that quiet crying, and the eyes. The, the, the ears of the Lord hears those cries. I love that, don't you? Yes. So the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. I want to point out one more thing before we bring the message to a close. And I want to point out something that just really blessed my heart. Isaiah 59 verse 1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy, that it, can't, that it cannot hear. I love that phrase, heavy. What is a heavy ear? Think about it. What are we talking about when you say a heavy ear? Are we talking about an ear that can't hear? No, we're not. Are we talking about an ear that has got damage and just can't focus? And can't? No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about an ear that's overloaded. Hear me, we're talking in the ear that's got all kinds of noises coming its way. We're talking in the ear that's, that's pounding. There's a, his ear is, uh, uh, says, neither is his ear uh, heavy that he cannot hear. Meaning that God, in this world of clamor, in this world of sorrow, in this world of crying, in this world of heartache, in this world of noise, God's not overloaded. He can hear you over the grinding steel of disappointment. God can hear you over the, the bombs that explode and the bursting in the air and the, uh, uh, the, the turbulence all around. God can hear you. In the midst of the storm, he can hear you. In the midst of the noisy and howling winds, uh, in the midst of the, uh, uh, the clamor of this planet, he can hear you. His ear is not overloaded. His ear is not too heavy. His ear is not heavy. He's not overloaded that he can't hear you. He hears everybody. He knows your need. He knows your hurt. And the Lord's hand is not short that he cannot save. Neither is his ear too heavy that he cannot hear you and me. He hears us. He loves us. Yeah. Yeah. I'll close with this in keeping with the God's bucket list. This man in Acts chapter 3 no doubt felt abandoned felt disappointed every time Jesus passed by. This man no doubt felt like he was being left out. But God had a purpose. And that man was on God's bucket list. I want you to know you may be, and I, I know you are, on God's bucket list. Maybe your healing hasn't come yet, but it's yet, yet. 
you're on God's bucket list. Maybe you don't know what's going to happen in your life. You're getting older. There's disappointments coming, but you're on God's bucket list. I want you to know every saint of God that sleeps in the graveyard is on God's bucket list. I want you to know that every person that's disappointed and hurting and feel like they're rejected, you are, they are on God's bucket list. God has plans for you. God has plans for every person in this room. And God has plans for every person that's not in this room. God has plans for the weary, plans for the hurting, plans for those that have fallen asleep in Christ. God has plans for you and I. God has plans for your life. God has plans for the years ahead. God has plans for you. You're on God's bucket list. The whole church is on God's bucket list. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remaining shall be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be fulfilled in God's bucket list. What an amazing God. God has a bucket list for you. Maybe you haven't reached it yet, but you will. God has plans for you. Say, well, it's up to me. No, it's not up to you. God has plans for you. He has a bucket list. How many know, since God has a bucket list, he probably will have his bucket full. He probably will get it all done. I can see me not getting it all done. I can see you not getting it all done. But if God, and he surely does, have a bucket list, I promise you, he'll get it all done. He which has begun a good work in you, Philippians 1, 6, he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Being confident of this very thing, he which began a good work in me or you, he will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. God is going to get you from here to there. In heaven, God is going to get you from where you are and bring you to where he is. God's going to bring you to success. God's going to heal you. If it takes a resurrection, he's going to heal you. Whatever happens in your life, he's going to bless you. God's not going to lose one of you. You trust him. You love him. You focus on him. And his eyes dart back and forth to touch you. If you're facing a knife in surgery, God's got you on his bucket list. God's got his eyes upon you. He's right. His eyes are darting back and forth just to find that one person that trusts him, that is focused on him, that loves him, so that God can show himself strong in their life. I'm glad we got a strong God. Woo, he's a strong God. Amen. Hallelujah. Stand with me. We're going to give an invitation. You are on God's bucket list. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're going through today. But I want you to know that God has not abandoned you. And God has not forsaken you. God has not forgotten you. You are on God's bucket list. I've got some family members that's went on to be with the Lord. I've got some family members that, that their, their, their bodies sleep in the graveyard. But every one of my loved ones that have died and went on to the other side, God has them in his bucket list. He has us in his bucket list. Thank God we got a God that's going to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I believe it was Apostle Paul said, I am persuaded of this one very thing. I'm persuaded of this one thing. I'm committed unto Him. Persuaded, committed unto Him that He'll keep me, that He'll save me, that He'll help me against that day. I'm persuaded. And I want you to know that I am persuaded. I am persuaded, no matter what happens tonight, no matter what happens tomorrow, no matter what happens next week, I am persuaded. No matter as what happened in my life over the weeks or over the past years, I am persuaded. I am persuaded 
I am confident of this very thing. I am persuaded. And I have I committed my life to him against that day, God will take care of me. Because God is my Savior, I'm not. God is my Redeemer, I'm not. God is my powerful God, I am not. But I joyfully accept the fact that I am in God's bucket list. And God has plans for me and he has plans for you. You are in God's bucket list. Say, well, I haven't been healed yet. You're in God's bucket list. Say, well, I'm going through a hard time. You're in God's bucket list. Say, I'm struggling. You're in God's bucket list. God loves you. Take, take, some, take, take it from this lame man. In Acts chapter 3, God says, I'll have him on my bucket list. And God used that lame man to set a fire on the day of Pentecost. Actually, the fire was released on the day of Pentecost by the Holy Ghost coming. But God chose this lame man to be that extra ignition, that extra igniting, so that 8,000 people would be saved in just a matter of days. What an incredible bucket list he was in. We get, give an invitation. Maybe you've been struggling. Maybe you've been hurting. Maybe you've little, been a little doubtful. Would you just come to this altar tonight and say, God, I thank you that I'm in your bucket list. Would you do that today? Right there where you're standing, would you thank God that you are in his bucket list? Yeah, you are. 